I'm very pleased to be here. A very impressive institution. Uh, the building, the equipment, and particularly the people. I'm very impressed and pleased to be here. In fact, I think you know so much about lasers and optics, I'm not sure I can tell you anything you don't know. Uh, but uh, I was in fairly early on the laser, and uh, so maybe, some of, maybe that was before some of you came along. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, with history. But the uh, history of the laser uh, is an important example of a number of aspects of science and technology. <coughs> One is the unexpected results from basic research. The, the applications of basic research are practically never predictable. Uh, you discover new things and then new things come out of it that you haven't foreseen. Secondly, the importance of the interaction between science and engineering. Interaction of those fields is important. The contribution, thirdly, the contributions from a community of people. Science and technology grow from a community. A number of people uh, contribute and they stimulate each other and so on. Next is the financial payoff of basic research. Basic research paid off just enormously. We could afford to put a lot more into it and so on because the actual financial uh, results are enormous. It takes a while. It takes one or two decades before it pays off and this is why people don't quite recognize it. Uh, they want something immediate but it does pay off in the long run. And finally, and very importantly, our new ideas are very often resisted not only by the public but by experts. Experts are experts and they know a new idea is not theirs, why it's not right. Uh, <laughs> but we all have to be careful. Now, <clears throat> the origin of the laser came about from microwave spectroscopy. Microwave spectroscopy of all things. Who thought that would be especially useful? But uh, there were three original sources, uh, Basov and Prokhorov in Russia, Joe Weber in the University of Maryland, and myself. All of us had background in microwave spectroscopy, the study of microwave, of spectroscopy with microwaves and an engineering background, those combinations. That's what the origin is. You see, it was three, three separate independent origins and they all, all people with that, that kind of background. Now, <coughs> I wanted very much to produce wavelengths still shorter than microwaves with which to do spectroscopy. Those good pure resonant, pure oscillators, which we had in the microwave range that developed during World War II and so on, those were producing such wonderful spectroscopy. I wanted to get on down to shorter wavelengths, shorter than a few millimeters, which is about as far as we could get then. I kept worrying about this and I tried one thing after another. My students tried, it didn't work. Finally, one morning I woke up early. I was the chairman of a national committee to try to advise on how it, how it could be done. We hadn't found anything. I woke up early in the morning. I went out and sat on a park bench in Franklin Park, Washington. And I remember very well, the bright sunshine. Why hadn't we been able to get the right idea? And I thought over things. Well, of course, molecules and atoms can produce short waves, but thermodynamics, and I was convinced, you know, I understood thermodynamics. Thermodynamics says you can't get more than a certain amount of intensity from them without heating them up. You have to heat them so high they'd fall apart and it was too bad. I said, hey, wait a minute. They don't have to obey thermodynamics. Ah, ah, oh boy. And I took out an envelope and wrote out an equation. Hey, it looks like it'll work. Looks like it'll work. We put molecules or atoms in an upper state, non-thermodynamic, and they can amplify and oh boy. Uh, and I didn't tell anybody for a while. I wrote it all down in my notebook and thought about it. Yeah, looks like it can work. Well, now, <coughs> um, so I persuaded one of my students, Jim Gordon, to start to try to do his thesis and make one work. And I thought, well, I'd work in a microwave field first because I already had equipment there and would prove that it could work and then we'd move on down to shorter wavelengths. And so we used ammonia molecules and a beam of ammonia molecules, picked out high excited states to try to get amplification. My student worked on it for a couple of years. The chairman of the department, who was a, a molecular beam expert and we were using molecular mo mo beams. Professor Cush, and he has a Nobel Prize. And Professor Robbie, who had been the very previous chairman, also had a Nobel Prize already. They both came into my office and they were both experts in molecular beams. They said, look, Charlie, that's not going to work. You know it's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. You've got to stop. You're wasting the department's money. You've got to stop. Well, fortunately, 
I was an associate professor, I had tenure. <laughs> they couldn't fire me. And I said, no, I think it has a reasonable chance. I'm going to continue. Well, they marched out of my office kind of angrily. And I continued. And about two and a half months, a student, student dashed in, in my classroom and said, hey, it's working. And we all went out and saw it working. And Robbie and Cush both congratulated me later. Uh, <laughs> now, as we'd had it working, I uh, happened to know Niels Bohr slightly, and Niels Bohr, of course, is a famous physicist and then in quantum mechanics and knew a great deal. And he asked me what I was doing. I told him, well, we had this oscillator, which I call the MESA, microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. My students and I picked up, invented the name. We had this thing, and it was very, very pure frequency. I told him, how pure frequency? Niels Bohr looked at me and said, oh, oh no, that's not possible. No, no, you must, not, must misunderstand. Something's wrong. No, that's not possible. I said, no, we've got it working. Oh, oh no, it can't, that, that can't be. I, I, sus I suspect you're thinking of the uncertainty principle. Uh, I said, we've got it working. He finally said, well, well, maybe you're right, but I'm not sure you ever believe me. Uh, another occasion, I was with John von Neumann at a cocktail party, and he asked me what I was doing. I told him we had this off. He said the same thing. Oh, no, no, that, that's impossible. No, you, there's something wrong. You don't understand. Oh, no. I said, no, you got it working. Oh, no, that can't be. And he went off and got another cocktail. About 15 minutes later, he said, hey, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> He'd figured it out. Multiple molecules can disobey the uncertainty principle for a single molecule. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then he wanted, wanted to discuss the idea a great deal more, of course. Uh, well, now, um, <clears throat> That's the way it is. Now, I, shortly after that, I went on sabbatical to France. And of course, I was thinking about mazes. Mazes were becoming very popular. Everybody was excited about them. Nobody paid any attention when I was working at it. For, I worked at it for about three years, you see. People come into my laboratory and say, oh, yeah, well, uh huh. I mean, nobody else tried to do it. Uh, once we had it working, then it was exciting to everybody. I went to France, and one of my former students was there in a postdoc position, and I talked with him what he was doing. He was working on electron spins up and down. Oh, wait a minute. That's the way, you know, we make more electrons up and down, and then we can have a tunable measure. Oh, boy. So we worked on it there. And uh, uh, Arnie, Arnie Honig uh, uh, and uh, Combrisson, a Frenchman, we worked on it there, and uh, the first Spin laser. Now, in addition, that same idea had come up to Strandberg at MIT, and he talked about it. He hadn't gotten one working. And Bloombergen from Harvard listened. Oh, well, that gave him an idea. Oh, well, he was, he'd been working on electrons and crystals where they have th three levels. Say, oh, look, you can excite from here to there, and then it can fall down to there and amplify. So he invented the three-level measure. Uh, you see how ideas get exchanged. Uh, <coughs> I went on to Japan. In Japan, I ran into a biologist that I'd known at Columbia University, and he was on sabbatical. And I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm studying the fluctuations in the numbers of uh, microorganisms. The microorganisms can split, and they multiply, or they can die. And I'm looking at the statistics of their population. I said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, uh, let me see your equation. I'd like to see your equations. That I think maybe that fits. You see, I was worrying about the fluctuations in a maser. Masers can, you can have a photon coming along, producing another photon, that doubles it. Photon can come along and get absorbed. That's like a microorganism dying. But then in addition to spontaneous emission, I had to add one term. So he showed me his equation, what is he doing? I got a mathematician, Takahashi, there in Japan to help me. <coughs> and we worked out the equation to get the fluctuations. And then that gives the ultimate sensitivity of a major amplifier. There's uh, another interaction, say, with biology of all things. Well, and so it, and so it grew. Well, now, uh, mazes became so popular, there are lots of publications about them, and the Physical Review was the first time ever that, look, we're getting so many, we've got to stop. We're not going to accept any more papers on mazes, <laughs> of all things. <laughs> Just had too many. <coughs> but nobody thought they could get down to much shorter wavelengths. Well, I wanted to get the shorter wavelength. That's the primary purpose. And I was sure we could. After a couple of years, I said, look, I'm just going to, I don't quite see how to do it. I'm just going to sit down and find, figure out the best way to do it. And I wrote down the equations of how to get the shorter wavelengths and what it would take to excite molecules in the infrared of visible region. 
and look, and uh, hey, wait a minute, look, get on, we can get right on down to the visible region. And I wrote down the equation, look, yeah, that was a laser. But I went out to Bell Labs, I was consulting Bell Labs, and Art Sholo, who'd been a postdoc with me, was there, and I talked to him about it. And I said, well, you know, I've been interested, I've been wondering, and let's talk about it. So we talked about it together. And Art invented the idea of having two mirrors. I was just going to have a cavity, but two flat mirrors like this. He'd been working on an interferometer with two, two mirrors, and oh, that makes a resonator. And so we together invented a laser, and we took the, um, I told Art, look, take, take this to the Bell Labs where his patent law is. We'd better give the patent to Bell Labs. I'd already patented the laser in the general idea, but the laser patent at Bell Labs. So he took it to the lawyer, and they called me up the next week and said, well, they think they don't want to bother to patent it. They say, well, light's never been useful for communications. Uh, <laughs> And so they don't think they want to bother, and they told me, if you want to patent it, you just go ahead and patent it. I said, wait a minute, we, we mustn't cheat Bill Labs just because the lawyers don't understand. You go tell them it can be used for communication. And they said, well, okay, if you can write a patent showing how it's being used for communications, we'll patent it. And so we persuaded them to patent it, which they did. And of course, it's obvious it could be used for communication, obvious to us at least. We didn't make the first laser. The first laser was actually made by Maimon, but we published it. I knew then if I started working on the laboratory, everybody would see it and then would want to duplicate it and they would compete with me. I thought, well, we'll go ahead and publish the theory then, so we published the paper. And then everybody jumped in. And now, see, interestingly, all the first mazes were built in industry. Industry can put a lot of concentrated work onto something, and all the first mazes were built in industry, but by students who had been hired by industry, students who trained in microwave and radio spectroscopy. So it had this background. They'd gone to industry and they could concentrate on it. Ted Maiman was the first. But then there were others. Ollie Javon, one of my students, invented another major at Bell Labs. Ted Maiman was at Hughes. Uh, Sorokin and Stevenson actually did the second one. They, Stevenson was one of my students. Sorokin was a student from Harvard. They were at IBM and so on. So it went. And then finally Hall at General Electric invented uh, semiconductor lasers and so on. It just grew and grew and grew. Um, now, um, so it came about from microwave spectroscopy of all things, but now we know there are mazes and lasers in space. They've been there for billions of years. They're very powerful. If we had been listening in the radio region, we could have picked them up back in the 1930s. Water mazes, uh, ammonia mazes, water mazes, very, very powerful. There are water mazes out there more powerful than all the power of the sun. Uh, and we could have picked it up many years ago and we said, what, how in the world is that happening? And somebody would have figured it out. And, well, maybe we can make one here on Earth. So that's another place it could have come from, but it didn't. The mazes and lasers are both out there. Well, um, let me talk now a little bit about, well, I, as you know, people have contrib contributed and contributed and uh, many, many things have come out of it. One of the impressive things is the power that lasers can give. University of Kyoto has produced a power up to 10 to the 15th watts. 10 to the 15th watts. That's a pulse. You can't pay for that much power continuously. <laughs> Too expensive. <laughs> but in a pulse, you can get 10 to the 15th watts. Now, the Livermore Laboratory is building a laser. They hope to get about five or, five or 10 times that much. Five or 10 times more than 10 to the 15th watts. And to concentrate it and to get a power density of 10 to the 23rd watts per square centimeter. Now that'll give, they want to do it to make fusion. That'll give its kinetic temperature of up to more than a billion degrees. Give a field strength of a few times 10 to the 14th volts per centimeter. That's a, of the voltage at a, at a nucleus of an atom, high voltage. And it, it's comparable to feel the nucleus of an atom and very strong, very strong field, very powerful. In addition to power, uh, lasers can be very delicate. Lasers have cooled atoms to less than a millionth of one degree, absolute. Lasers have been used to be very, very gentle, cooling atoms to the lowest possible temperature. Uh, then there are laser tweezers. With laser tweezers, you can pick up, a, pick up a, a microorganism or even just a few atoms at a time, pick them up and move them around and so on. Laser tweezers, very gentle as well as very powerful. High precision. In measure very short times, they get pulses as short is about 10 to the minus 16 seconds. 1.7 times 10 to the minus 16 is the shortest that I know, produced by uh, Lopez Martin and others in Sweden. Others have, others have done similar things. Very high precision timing. 
Hydrogen masers have a precision of about part in 10 to the 15th, timing precision. And that's the best we have. Actually, a cesium beams do about as well. They're not masers, they do about as well, but hydrogen maser is as good as anything. Sensitivity and amplification. Uh, a maser or a laser amplifier can produce as much sensitivity as is theoretically possible. It gets down to zero point fluctuations, which is the noise temperature of H nu over K. Zero point fluctuation gets down to as low, 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 uh, as sensitive as possible. When we first came along with the masers, pointed out how sensitive they were, and they were about 100 times more sensitive than any amplifiers available at that time. And many people jumped into the field. But then someone working on parametric amplifiers came along and me and said, well, you know, I'm working on parametric amplifiers. I looked at your theory. You think they, it looks to me like they can be as, as sensitive as masers. I looked, hey, hey, that's right. Parametric amplifiers are just as good. Nobody recognized that. <coughs> so now parametric amplifiers are cheaper to build and they're the ones that are used for the most sensitive amplifiers in the microwave region now. Positioning. You measure position very precisely. Take a thousand meters, you can measure it to 10 to the minus six centimeters. That's a precision of about a part in 10 to the 11th. But it can be better. We can send pulses to the moon, pulses which are about 10 to the minus four centimeters long. We have a distance of about four times 10 to the 10 centimeters. This is a precision of a few times 10 to the minus 15. Send beam to the moon, measure its position, it's a fraction of a wavelength in a sense. Um, Control, we can control position. We can do it by interferometry and by pointing and so on. Imaging. Coherent production of x-rays in particular, it gives us very precise imaging. Down to some tens of amounts of them. And I know excellent work is being done here <laughs> uh, on this. And uh, I think you may, you may beat the world on it. <laughs> Uh, and get a resolution down to uh, 30, 30th of a light wavelength or, or less, and why not go further and further? X-rays and gamma rays even. Uh, many other forms of imaging. Nonlinear optics. Now it's interesting, nonlinear optics came along. It was something of a surprise to me. Uh, actually, uh, there'd been one kind of nonlinear optics, Raman effect, before that. But nobody tried to extend it or thought it could be extended to nonlinear optics because they just didn't have light that's intense enough to do anything. Now, with this intense light, nonlinear optics came along. It was obvious to some people who did it. It was a breakthrough to me. I hadn't, I hadn't quite waked up to this until it was done. Then, of course, I enjoyed doing a lot of it, nonlinear optics, and that's created a whole new field. Take nonlinear optics and interact two or three photons, and you get a whole new range of things. Uh, uh, just a, a, a wonderful new field. If you look overall, what lasers have done, let's look at science. There are 18 Nobel Prizes that have been given in connection with masers and lasers. 18 Nobel Prizes. Now, not all of those were just for invention of masers and lasers. Most of them were using masers and lasers to do new things that couldn't be done before. Mostly in physics, some in chemistry. But using masers and lasers as tools, doing things that couldn't be done before, such as cooling atoms, for example, the Nobel Prize and that. But 18 Nobel Prizes, uh, Nobel Prizes to peep the individual, not 18 separate Nobel Prizes, have been given in science. That's just a, a picture of some of its contributions to science. What about technical applications? Well, the technical applications are just terrific. And in spite of what uh, Bell Laboratories uh, lawyers first, first thought, uh, <coughs> in communications, for example, we now have in a single beam, people have communicated about 10 to the 12th bits per second in a single beam. Just think of what extension of any radio and microwaves that was. And it's cutting, cutting and welding. It never occurred to me that lasers would be so important cutting. I knew yesterday it produced very, in, very intense, very concentrated radiation. I was interested in that. I could heat up things, but such a broad uh, application in cutting and welding now. Then in medical applications, very gentle, very gentle localized surgery and flesh surgery and so on. Lots of medical applications. 
computer information, computer and, and tech, information and technology, as measuring, surveying, positioning, amplifiers, and this nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is a fantastic field uh, developing and, uh, and uh, all kinds of new things. I'm sure you can imagine a lot of them, but I can't. There's laser TV that's coming along and uh, its development will be interesting. But let's look at, look at a little bit at possible future. Uh, well, in science, I'm looking forward to the wide range of frequencies and tunability and the low cost and how short arrays can be made, a wide range. We get down in the X-ray region, how far in the X-ray region can we go, how short a wavelengths, and on into the gamma ray region maybe, controlling them. And wow, you know, electromagnetic radiation is fantastic and all the frequencies it covers and all the different kinds of phenomena. And as we uh, control it more and more on down to shorter wavelengths, it's going to produce a lot of uh, science and technology. Higher precision, how high can we go? We're talking about 10 to the minus 15 now. How many more items of magnitude? How far can we go? And will we be able to um, maybe measure changes in the physical constants? Changes with time, changes with position, or what? What new physics can be tested as we get higher and higher precision? Measuring time, for example. Uh, <coughs> Katori at University of Tokyo hopes to get down to part and 10 to the 18th in the measurement of time. He predicts he can do this, he's, uh, and he will trap atoms, and uh, we will, will be interesting to find out. Now there's imaging. We're getting better and better, another fact of 10, another fact of 10. Get down to atomic resolution, maybe. How good, how far can we go? And maybe also with the use of, of uh, negative refraction indices. That's being of great interest now and being worked on. Negative practice in, in the index can allow uh, high resolution in specialized ways. Shorter pulses, how short a pulse? Can we get down to maybe we're down to 10 to the minus 16, can we get down to 10 to the minus 18 seconds? Maybe those short times, how high in power density? We're up now at power densities, <coughs> which is high as about any power density we imagine in the center of the center of a star, for example. That allows us to study fusion. And lasers are being thought of very hard now and worked on for the study of fusion. Uh, so we're in that realm. How much further can we go with high power densities? Is, is there any, any limit? Well, certainly, why not another factor of 10? Another factor of 100? How high? And with those high intensities, we can get particle, particle acceleration. With intensity now, with particle acceleration, can be done with laser beams. And higher and higher particle energies. One imaginative thing also, may or may not come about, is discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's being done. People are searching for radio beams, microwave beams, and, but also, I pointed out, can be done in the laser region. Light is just as efficient as the radio waves and sending over long distance because you can concentrate the beam so much. Now people are looking for light waves from extraterrestrial planets. Is there some life out there sending us signals? Should we be trying to signal, send signal? We find some promising planet out there, should we be trying to send it a signal and say, hey, send a signal back to us, let us know you're there? Will we discover light with beams? We can't very well go to planets around other stars. That's uh, so far, a human lifetime, a human lifetime, we couldn't get there. But on the other hand, we can send signals back and forth. And there will be communication with other, 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 other life and other intelligent life. And how much will they tell us that we don't already know? In technology, we improve the efficiency, lower the price, make, them more, make lasers more flexible, get down to shorter and shorter waves, down to the gamma ray region maybe. Nanotechnology, manipulation, manufacture, and measurement. Uh, study of chemical molecule to molecule interactions and so on. Medicine, non-invasive operations with fibers is already beginning. I mentioned fusion. That's uh, in technology, that's very likely to come along. Better measuring, surveying, positioning. How good and how cheap can we make this in the long run? 
the way we are. Now, uh, you are the people who are going to do this kind of thing. You see, I, time and, of course, I've, I've been lucky to be, to have created some things, but time and again, new things come along that I didn't previously imagine. And some of you are going to do them. And interact with other people and uh, learn from other people. They learn from you. Uh, this field is a fantastic field. It's growing and growing. The potentialities of electromagnetic spectrum are just enormous. Uh, and uh, it's exciting to see what you're doing here. I look forward to hearing more about the future from you. Thank you. Thank you.